Jean-Francois Champollion was born on the 23rd of December 1790 in Figac, France. He was the youngest of seven children and had a strange upbringing. His mother was often absent and his father was a drunk who was busy working as a book trader. This left him to be raised primarily by his elder brother, Jacques Joseph. In 1801, young Champollion left the Gaillac and went to study in Grenoble. It was left to his elder brother to provide for young Champollion and pay his education. From a young age, Champollion's gift for languages was apparent. After only two years of studying, he had already learned Greek as well as Latin, and then he advanced onto more difficult languages like Ethiopic and Arabic. Champollion's elder brother wanted to join Napoleon's Egyptian expedition. He frequently spoke to Champollion regarding this topic, and his brother's desires may have sparked his interest in Egypt. In 1804, he attended secondary school in Grenoble. It was here that he took an interest in Coptic. Coptic Egyptian is the most recent form of the Egyptian language, and it wasn't long until he conquered it. By this point, he had developed an immense curiosity for ancient Egypt, and was eager to study its long-lost language. This led to him enrolling in the Collège de France in Paris, where he specialised in Oriental languages. While at university, he started to decipher a copy of the Rosetta Stone under the first Frenchman to try and read it, Sylvestre de Sassy. Champollion managed to interpret the same readings that had been made a few years prior, meaning he was going in the right direction. At one point, he had become so immersed in what he was learning that he started to call himself an Arab nickname and wore Arab clothing. In 1809, he earned his degree in Doctor of Letters. At the age of 20, he went back to Grenoble, and here, he took up a position they had reserved for him as assistant professor of ancient history. His wage wasn't great, and Champollion struggled financially. Despite his economic situation, Champollion was progressing in his field of work. However, it seemed like it was all about to come to a dramatic stop. Around this time, conscription was introduced in France. The mortality rate in the Napoleonic army was very high, so there's a good chance that Champollion would die in service. Fortunately, his elder brother and Joseph Fourier, a fellow Egyptologist and the prefect of Grenoble, argued that Champollion's work was very important and could not be interrupted he had managed to avoid joining the Napoleonic army. In 1815, Napoleon escaped his exile. He made it to the Côte d'Azur, and he marched with his army to Grenoble. While there, the two men got a chance to meet, and they spoke about Champollion's work. He revealed that he had completed a Coptic dictionary that included grammar. His brother also backed Napoleon's cause, and even aided one of his generals in fleeing persecution. Once the royalists regained power, the brothers were sentenced to internal exile in their hometown, Figeac, for supporting Napoleon. A few years earlier, he had met a woman named Rosine Blanc. They got engaged within the year, and in 1818, they got married. Initially, Rosine's father didn't like Champollion being with his daughter. He was an assistant professor, and didn't earn very much money. But, as his reputation grew, so did his liking toward him. In 1824, they had a daughter named Zored. Champollion was fairly happy in his marriage. However, due to his work, he was frequently away from home for long periods. This is what might have led to him exchanging love letters with another woman, although he never had relations with her. The royalist regime in France that succeeded Napoleon had many upper-class supporters that believed education should be reserved for the elite. This led to Champollion setting up various schools 
and in 1821 he even led a revolt. Supported by a band of Grenoblians, he captured Grenoble's citadel and removed the royalist flag, replacing it with the tricolour. This led to him being charged with treason, and he had to go into hiding. Fortunately, it wasn't too long until he was pardoned. The story of the Rosetta Stone began over 2,000 years ago, having been carved in 196 before Christ. The Rosetta Stone was written in two languages, Greek and Egyptian. However, it had three scripts, hieroglyphics, Greek, and Demotic. It wasn't until 1799, with its discovery by French troops in Egypt, that the Western world knew of its existence. Before Champollion, many talented scholars had tried to decipher the symbols on the stone, but their success was limited. Champollion spent all of his free time working on the hieroglyphic script. His knowledge of Coptic came in very handy. In the mid-1810s, he faced competition from other competent scholars, such as Thomas Young and his former teacher, Silvestre de Saisi. Thomas Young managed to successfully translate the text written in Demotic by 1814. After completing this, he aimed to decipher the hieroglyphics. The lost language had left archaeologists and scholars alike scratching their heads, finding it very difficult to decipher. However, Young wasn't like the rest. He made progress on his interpretation and started to understand the alphabet that hieroglyphics used. Champollion had already made advances on the script before he began to dedicate his life to deciphering the hieroglyphics. In 1808, he worked out that there were similarities between the Demotic script and the Coptic language, as Demotic had 15 signs that were alphabetical letters in Coptic. Ten years later, he discovered that some of the signs found in Demotic were actually phonemes, a unit of sound that distinguished one word from another. This meant that the Egyptian script was only in part alphabetical. One of his key breakthroughs came when he recognised the name Ptolemy. He managed to do this by comparing the hieroglyphics to Demotic and Greek. This allowed him to understand the meaning of several signs that had previously been unclear. Then, he successfully deciphered the word Cleopatra. With this, he now had 12 characters which he fully understood. However, his main discovery came when he deciphered the verb M-I-S that had to do with birth. By comparing this finding to other languages, symbols and rules, he realised he was very close to achieving what he had spent years working on. Following the discovery, he immediately ran down the street to his brother and yelled, I've got it! He was so excited that it actually caused him to collapse. By using this, he was now able to translate the Rosetta Stone. From 1821 to 1824, he dedicated all his life to studying and translating the text on the stone. In 1822, Champollion published his findings in his Lettre à M. Dacier, which was addressed to the secretary of the French Academy des Inscriptions, Bon Joseph Dacier. In its contents, he established a list of hieroglyphic signs and their Greek translations, as well as showcasing other findings. Two years later, he published a book which was dedicated to King Louis XVIII. The book's title was Précis du système hiéroglyphique des anciens égyptiens. The book had an even more advanced translation and an almost perfect understanding of the Egyptian grammatical system. This work is considered to be the starting point for the modern field of Egyptology. Champollion's findings were praised by many. Among these people was Young, who was very impressed by what he had achieved. Nevertheless, Young believed he deserved credit as he had laid the foundation 
for deciphering the Rosetta Stone. He claimed that it was his articles that Champollion used as a basis for his translation. Champollion, however, had no intention of recognising Young's work, and their relationship quickly went downhill. Champollion maintained that he alone deciphered the hieroglyphics, despite Young's initial work. At the time, tensions were still high between the French and the English, as the Napoleonic Wars had just ended. Evidently, the French supported Champollion as the man who deserved all the credit, while the British backed Young. At that time, Champollion was the most knowledgeable man in the world when it came to understanding hieroglyphic grammar. He even pointed out the mistakes made by Young. In 1826, Champollion was appointed as curator of the Louvre Museum's Egyptian collection. Despite tensions with Young, he gave him access to demotic manuscripts that were held there. The next year, the museum's Egyptian collection was opened to the public. On the 21st of July, 1828, Champollion led an expedition to Egypt, along with Ippolito Rossellini, the professor of Oriental languages at the University of Pisa. The group first arrived in Alexandria on the 18th of August, and from there they travelled upstream along the River Nile and studied a large number of monuments and inscriptions. On the 19th of September, they made it to Cairo and they stayed there for over a month. They continued the expedition on the 1st of October, when they set out for the sites of Memphis, Saqqara and Giza. Champollion managed to examine tombs and sacred monuments. This allowed him to improve his knowledge of hieroglyphics. He was fascinated by everything he saw, as, since he was a boy, he held a passion for Egypt's ancient language and culture. Unfortunately, during this period, there were many people looting ancient artefacts and destroying the monuments. Even Champollion's expedition caused certain artefacts to be broken. For example, while in the Valley of the Kings, Champollion accidentally damaged the tomb of Seti I and the tomb KV-17. He did this by removing two large wall panels while trying to get as far into the tomb as possible. Sadly, the panels couldn't be fixed. The broken panels were taken back to France along with other items. The expedition spent around 10,000 francs on antiques. These artifacts were transported to the Louvre and the many people from Tuscany that were also part of the expedition took items to the Museum of Florence in Italy. Following the expedition, Champollion made suggestions to better the situation in Egypt. The frequent looting had led to the loss of many ancient artefacts. To solve this issue, the Egyptian authorities commissioned a museum to be built to house the antiques and ordered a halt on exporting artefacts. The expedition led to the publishing of an extensive book in 1845 called Monument de l'Egypte et de la Nubie. In 1830, Champollion became a member of the Académie d'Inscription, and in 1831, a professor of Egyptology at the Collège de France. A special position was created specifically for Champollion in recognition of his work. He was the first chair of Egyptian history and archaeology at the university. Unfortunately, he didn't keep the position as chair for very long. Following years of hard work and the draining two-year expedition in Egypt, he died of a stroke in 1832 while in Paris. He was buried in the Père Lachaise Cemetery at the age of 41. Champollion is credited as the man who successfully translated the Egyptian hieroglyphics on the Rosetta Stone, giving us a deeper insight into life in ancient Egypt. This, along with his expedition, which was the first attempt to examine all of the ancient Egyptian monuments, provided the world with a better understanding of the Egyptian culture. He is widely considered as the father of Egyptology. However, 
it's important to recognise the initial strides made by Thomas Young and William Banks that laid the foundations which inevitably helped Champollion in the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. Thank you everyone for listening to this video on Champollion. If you enjoyed, please like and comment. And if you're new to the channel, it would mean a lot if you guys could subscribe. And that's all from me. So I'll see you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.